Star of America's newsroom. I'm Sandra Smith. That sounds horrible. That sounds serious. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but the forecast is pretty much it's pretty much to the number so far. Yeah. I mean, the way they were talking about it, it's, it's happening. It's happening. Uh, I'm Bill Hemmer. Good morning, everybody. That blast of winter weather and plunging temps blamed for 17 deaths so far across wide areas of the U.S. That storm system slamming the south where schools are now shutting their doors in parts of Florida and Georgia and South Carolina. Authorities there urging drivers stay off the road and stay off the covered roads that could turn into sheets of ice because in a lot of places behind the storm, the temperatures are going to drop a lot. The Northeast expected to bear the brunt of the storm, where some cities could get more than a foot of snow and the whipping winds could also lead to coastal flooding and widespread power outages. Here's the governor in Rhode Island telling people to get ready. We are expecting power outages right now. The prediction is for very high winds. Uh, that combination of high winds with incredibly low temperatures is dangerous. So plan now for what will happen if you lose power. And, and if you do lose power, leave your home. Brian Yenis is live in Boston where a blizzard warning is currently in effect. Brian, what's the biggest concern right now where you are? Hey, Sandra, look, it's just like what the governor of Rhode Island just said. Here in Massachusetts, the biggest concern is along the coast. We're talking the South Shore and along the eastern side here of Massachusetts. And that is because we're expecting hurricane force gusts. We're talking 50, 60, 70 miles per hour here at the height of the storm. Now, this storm at, the, at its height is supposed to be around from now to about 4, 5 o'clock uh, later, earlier this evening. So they're expecting not only these high winds, but you're talking about a wet snow, also uh, freezing rain. And when you combine all of that with the power lines and you combine 70 mile an hour winds, that is bad news. And that means power outages in freezing weather. Back here in Boston, we're expecting some two to three inches of snow at its height uh, per hour. We're also expecting about a foot of snow here, 12 inches, maybe even more. The city is under a, uh, uh, a winter emergency. We're seeing some some vehicles going by, there is a parking ban in place, and that is because the last thing they want is for people to crowd the plow. They would have some 4,000 pieces of equipment out here in Massachusetts ready to plow and continue to plow as this storm hits. Of course, they want uh, people to stay off the roads today. Over 550 public schools here in Boston are closed as we get ready for these blizzard-like conditions. Some whiteout conditions expected here, and especially here in Boston and around the coast here in Massachusetts, Sandra. So, Brian, it's snow for now, but then after that comes this extreme cold. Yeah, we. I was kidding, uh, sort of kidding yesterday, but I spoke to some locals and they're like, it's a balmy 24. That was last night. And that is because we are just wrapped out, uh, wrapped up here in Boston. Seven days a week of the coldest, it's, it's the coldest week Boston has seen in 100 years. Seven days in which the temperature did not go above 20 degrees. Yesterday was a bit of a balmy 24. And now we're expecting the temperatures after the storm goes by to hit some negative two, negative eight degrees on Friday, Saturday. That's a wind chill of negative 20. And with people without power, that can be a dangerous situation. Listen to the, uh, well, the governor also talked to earlier today, and he talked about that, that he wants people to stay inside, but to also be careful with their homes. Those heating vents, if there's snow on them, it can prevent the homes from being, uh, from being heated properly and carbon monoxide poisoning. So make sure you stay warm and stay safe, Sandra. It can be a very dangerous situation for a lot of people. Brian Yenis, thank you. Another alert now, move down the coast, Washington, D.C. Big meeting at the White House about to go down. Republican Senate leaders will meet with the president and vice president to talk about immigration reform and a lot of other things. Democrats insisting on a fix for the dreamers, but Republicans so far will not do a bill unless it includes funding for the border wall. So that's kind of where the lines are drawn. Mike Emanuel's on the Hill now live. Mike, good morning to you. What is the state of play on immigration now before that meeting gets underway? Well, Bill, Republicans are trying to keep immigration separate from the ongoing budget talk. Six Republican senators heading to the White House for that immigration meeting, including Republican Whip John Cornyn of Texas. Also attending will be Tom Cotton, Lindsey Graham, Chuck Grassley, James Langford, and Tom Tillis. White House aides say President Trump wants any immigration package to include securing the border with a wall, closing loopholes that hamstring enforcement, end chain migration, and cancel the visa lottery. The House Republican Whip notes this was a central issue in the 2016 campaign.
when they elected Donald Trump as president, uh, one of the forefront issues was making sure that we build the wall. And I think it's important that Congress follow through on that. That's surely part of the discussions that we're having on a budget agreement. And as you, you talk about DACA, uh, look, I'm not for amnesty, but I do think there are a lot of other things short of amnesty that you can do to make our legal system of immigration work even better. Scalise's point is the American people had a say in this in the election, Bill. What's the response from Democrats at this point, Mike? Well, Democrats are pushing for a solution for DACA for those children brought to this country illegally by their parents. They want it sooner than later. They say they're up for some security as part of an immigration deal, but they don't like that wall. There's plenty of, of sympathy for trying to deal with this issue uh, sooner rather than later on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the real question is, you know, the, the president sort of threw a monkey wrench into it a little bit over the weekend, saying that there, the wall has to be part of it. Um, clearly, border security does have to be part of it, but, uh, you know, the wall is in, in many ways, in many areas, in many parts, just not practical, feasible, uh, or sensible. Expect the showdown at some point over the wall versus other types of security. Bill? Thank you, Mike. We'll watch it. From the Hill, Mike Emanuel. Now, former Utah Congressman Jason Chaffetz uh, was on the show last uh, hour speaking about what he thinks should be done on immigration reform. I still think, at least from a conservative Republican viewpoint, they've got to reject the amnesty. They've got to lock down that border. They've got to get rid of the rewards and incentives. They're going to have to deal with asylum reform, uh, which is a piece of legislation that I worked on that, that needs to be dealt with. It, when you hear Democrats say they need comprehensive, that is code for we're not really going to solve this and we don't want to do it in a, in a bipartisan way. I really don't think so. I think there are lots of things that they can build bipartisan coalitions and solve. But if the Democrats say it's you, all or nothing, you think they've been gonna... dragging this out for too long, given politics. Democrats love the issue. I don't know that a lot of them want to actually solve it. We now bring in the chairman of the Senate Republican Policy Committee and member of the Foreign Relations Committee, John Barrasso of Wyoming. Uh, Senator, thank you for being here this morning. I know, it's a, I know it's a busy morning, first week of 2018, and there is an aggressive agenda out there. Is immigration reform setting up to be the next big fight? Well, we need to fund the government. I'm ready to do that. Immigration reform should be separate from that. I agree with the president. We need border security. We need enforcement. We need to be able to end this chain migration, something that started back in 1965 but has been hijacked since then. So I think they ought to be separated. We need to keep the government funded, and that's what a responsible governing body does not shut down the government which is what the democrats are talking about doing over the issue of immigration but clearly uh, democrats uh, they are making it very clear what they want and they want this daca fix in there and the white house says they do want to reach across the aisle uh, to get uh, something done i'm just wondering if there is a compromise reached what that looks like in a best case scenario for you well, for me, I need border security. That is critical to me, and that includes infrastructure, it includes manpower, it includes the technology to make sure we have a secure border. Senator McConnell has said if there is a bipartisan agreement and something the president says he will sign, then that will be brought to the Senate floor for a vote. But if the president isn't ready to sign it, there is no reason to go through uh, the, the, the floor debate in the Senate to deal with this. We need to keep the government funded, and that's what I'm focused on now, funding the priorities of the American people, which to me keeps the country safe and secure and strong, which is the funding for the military. And those priorities, Sarah Sanders at the White House yesterday said, for the White House have not changed. Listen our priorities on what we would hope to have in any immigration bill and any DACA deal uh, haven't changed. They would include um, securing the border with a wall, ensuring interior enforcement, eliminating the visa lottery program, and ending chain migration. All those things are still the same. And Senator, uh, before I let you go, um, with this big meeting happening today and the series of tweets that we have seen from the president recently, you sit on the Foreign Relations Committee. Mm -hmm. It's important to ask you your thoughts this morning, as you have already seen the president aggressively this week um, uh, tweeting about uh, obviously a lot of the topics on the table right now, including support for uh, the protesters in Iran to North Korea. My button is bigger than yours, uh, telling Kim Jong Un. What do you? think of all of that and, and the president's tweeting on this 
Well, I think the world is a much more dangerous place now than it was uh, 10 years ago, and we saw that as the last administration allowed things to go to a level that they should have never gotten to. I'm delighted that President Trump has taken an active role, and now we have much more involvement with China with regard to North Korea that we didn't have before. Uh, we have the support for the uh, Iranian protesters that we didn't have in a previous administration. You know, I think President Trump is right to be forcefully pushing forth the United States uh, as the, the most credible nation in terms of military, in terms of, uh, poli in terms of our policies, uh, and in terms of our economy. And this American first economy is allowing that to go forward. We have, you see it with the stock market today, right now, over 25,000. There is an incredible confidence in our country now as a result of the, the tax bill that has yep. passed and all the things that we're working on today uh, to strengthen our country. And, you know, Senator, as you say that, there's a, a picture of the, the big board of the Dow uh, topping 25,000 as you talk about that optimism um, surely showing up in the American stock market. All right, Senator Brasso, thank you for coming on this morning. Well, Good to see you. Thank you. I'm seeing it in Wyoming every day, this incredible confidence and optimism in our country and our economy. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The White House hitting back after Steve Bannon quoted in a new book insulting the president and his family. I think there are a number of factors that played in. I would certainly uh, think that going after the president's son in an absolutely outrageous and unprecedented way is probably not the best way to curry favor with anybody. Well, the book, the book excerpts just keep on coming. Will the Trump team now turn the page to focus on the major issues facing the country? Uh, Brett Baer is on deck. We'll talk to him about all that coming up in a moment. Plus, the House Intelligence Committee getting a victory in its hunt for documents in the anti-Trump dossier case. We will tell you what that is. And the Me Too movement continues to sweep the country. But are there political motives to some of the claims? Why one New York Times reporter says the answer to that question is yes. Another well-known women's rights attorney, Gloria Allred, who has brought mm. her fair share of sexual harassment allegations, is currently raising money for another lawsuit against Donald Trump. That's yet another example we found of an effort to raise money to so bring now you're forward providing and support examples these types of allegations. And watch the communication line that apparently was open yesterday between the North and the South. Stay tuned. I think um, furious, disgusted would probably certainly fit when you uh, make such outrageous claims and completely false claims against the president, uh, his administration and his family. Well, that was White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders yesterday responding to quotes attributed to Steve Bannon in a new book. The former White House chief strategist reportedly slamming the president's son and son-in-law. Meanwhile, attorneys for the president are trying to prevent any more disclosures by sending Bannon a cease and desist order. But Bayer is the anchor of special report and Farewell knows that this is what everybody's talking about this morning, Brett. Good morning. <laughs> uh, obviously, everybody here in Washington, but maybe not on the market. Mm, obviously, the Dow doesn't have uh, <laughs> a, a problem with this book. But uh, you're right. We have seen the letter that uh, the Trump attorneys have sent to Steve Bannon uh, telling him to cease and desist based on a non-disclosure agreement. That seems like it has a lot of substance, a lot of weight to it uh, based on what he may have signed in the White House, in his job there. Uh, and they are saying that legal action against Against Bannon is imminent based on the disparaging remarks that have come out so far in this book. But reportedly, the lawyers also sent a cease and desist letter to the publisher, Henry Holden Company, trying to get them to not publish this book next week. That seems uh, like a real long shot. The horse is kind of already out of the barn. The book's all, all over the place. And uh, based on, on libel, uh, if you're making that case, you would have to sit down and, and be deposed, probably and answer questions in this book that uh, obviously we've been talking about is very controversial. Here is one of the new excerpts today, uh, uh, Brett. You can't make this stuff up. Uh, I should say expletive um, in the place of the word. Uh, Sean Spicer, soon to be portrayed as the most hapless man in America, muttered to himself after his tortured press briefing on the first day of the new administration when he was called to justify the president's inaugural crowd numbers. And soon enough, he adopted this as a personal ma mantra. So, I I mean, this is this is one of the latest. Obviously, this is going to be, and I, I think on your program last night, Brett, you made it very clear. Here we go. There's going to be this trickle out, so the book.
comes out or if it comes out. We're going to learn something every day from this book. There's another yeah. one. Oh, definitely. And, and there are many people uh, who are going to have a problem with the way they're quoted in this. Uh, it sounds like Michael Wolff was given a lot of access inside that White House. He was there a lot. He claims to have more than 200 interviews with various Trump officials uh, or 200 interviews of, with officials and dozens of hours of tapes. Uh, if that's the case, uh, he can maybe back up some of these quotes. I think that Perhaps what happened in the chaos of the early days of the Trump administration, Steve Bannon brought him in, uh, and it literally at the beginning was like Grand Central Station. Mm. People were all over the place. This is, remember, pre-Chief of Staff mm -hmm. John Kelly. And, uh, and perhaps some things off the record uh, became on the record in this book. All of this when you think we should be focusing on some other big issues, right? There's this huge meeting happening at the White House today, a couple hours from now, right, Brett? Um, the, the president's yeah. meeter, the vice president, Senate Republican, uh, Republicans, uh, DACA, funding the government, all of this is on the table. And now there's this big distraction. Right, but for Capitol Hill, they can't get distracted because January 19th is the day the government runs out of money. Uh, so they have a lot to do and negotiate between now and then. And think about that time frame. Um, you know, usually this building behind me does not operate that quickly. Uh, so they have got to come to some conclusion, and Democrats are pushing back, saying they need a DACA deal. So that is going to be top priority. But this book is taking a lot of oxygen out of Washington. I do expect there to be some nuggets in here, however, that trigger some questions from some of the investigations up on Capitol Hill and perhaps the Mueller probe uh, on obstruction of justice. Brett, I want to jump in there now as we are just showing a picture of the book because Fox News has just confirmed that the White House wants to stop publication of this book. And I know you don't have your email in front of you, but we have no, just confirmed that. Okay. Yeah. And that's quite something because um, to do that, uh, you will have to. I, I can't imagine a federal judge closing the door on a book that's coming out uh, based on a lawsuit like this. But we'll see how it how it all comes out. Basically, I will say that this is the biggest promotion that a book could potentially mm. get is uh, for someone to say, don't publish it. All right. Clearly, this story is changing by the minute. Brett, thanks for coming on with us this morning. You got it. The anti-government protests continuing today in Iran. Day eight now. <laughs> So the White House wants the protesters to know it has their back. So what will be different this time? As we noted uh, before the break, when talking to Brett Baer in Washington, uh, we have confirmed that Trump's lawyers, uh, Donald Trump, the president's lawyers, have sent a letter to the publisher of that now, very controversial book, Fire and Fury, um, to the publisher, Michael Wolff, uh, asking to stop publication of that book. Um, we've now got the letter as well. It's a very lengthy letter uh, addressing the concerns that the White House and the president have over the publication of this book, saying your publication of the false and baseless statements about Mr. Trump gives rise, among other claims, defamation by libel, defamation by libel per se. It goes on uh, to make the case, Bill Hemmer. The White House says, do not publish that book is expected to be published and out next week. I, that's taken to another level of we were just talking with Brett a moment ago. This will draw more attention to it for those who have not paid attention already. But that, that excerpt that was released yesterday was long. Um, apparently happened over the last 12 months, according to the author and uh, those who were quoted in it. There was another excerpt that came out a bit earlier today, but my expectation is that we're going to get a lot more of this. Now, can the White House win a case like this legally? Well, we, don't we, will, know. we will see. And, and Steve Bannon on, on a radio program last night, uh, when asked about this by someone who called in, um, said the, the yeah. president's a great man. Uh, so the question is, are, are the are is the findings in the book? Are they true? No. So th this letter now follows the cease and desist order that went out late last evening, telling Steve Bannon to basically stop talking. Um, and the interview you referenced was during a talk show that he was doing on Sirius XM. Mm -hmm. And apparently he's on for a couple of hours. And this topic came up about two hours into the program. And the answer was, he's a great man. And I enjoyed working for him. And it pretty much stopped at that. So you wonder, well, are the lawyers from the White House making headway?
on that front. So stop so. publication of that book. That is now confirmed. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to move up to the House Intelligence Committee now. It's going to soon have its hands on these documents relevant to the anti-Trump dossier. This after they struck a deal between the committee and the Department of Justice. This now months after initial deadline for the information passed. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harris live in D.C. for more on this now. Catherine, what do you have? Well, thanks, Bill, and good morning. A source close to the issue tells Fox News that barring a last-minute agreement, the committee leadership would take an additional step and consider new subpoenas or moving forward with contempt of Congress citations. As you mentioned late last night, the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who oversees the Russia probe after the recusal of his boss, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, was on Capitol Hill along with the FBI director meeting with House Speaker Paul Ryan. Rosenstein breezed past reporters without taking their questions. The meeting focused on the House Intelligence Committee deadline for records and witnesses that goes back to August. Quote, after speaking to Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein this evening, Nunez said, I believe the House Intelligence Committee has reached an agreement with the Department of Justice that will provide the committee with access to all the documents and witnesses we have requested. The committee looks forward to receiving access to the documents over the coming days. The committee wants access to former FBI Director James Comey's so-called skinny inner circle of advisors, including demoted FBI agent Peter Strzok, FBI lawyer Lisa Page, with whom he was having an extramarital affair, as well as former general counsel James Baker. This group is directly tied to allegations of political bias and favorable edits in a July 2016 public statement by Comey that reduced Hillary Clinton's le legal exposure, pardon me, in the criminal email case bill. Uh, and the president's oh, former campaign manager suing the special counsel, among others. That's Paul Manafort. What's up with that? Well, that's right. According to the 17-page civil complaint, former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort and his legal team argue that the Russia probe has gone beyond the scope of the special counsel regulations. It reads in part, the investigation of Mr. Manafort is completely unmoored from the special counsel's original jurisdiction to investigate any links and or coordination between the Russian government and individuals associated with the campaign of President Donald Trump. Legal experts tell Fox News, though, that the suit will be challenging. There may be a fair legal question about the scope of the, of the independent prosecutor's jurisdiction, but Judge Jackson will decide that. The judge that actually has the criminal case in front of her is the one who's going to have the final say on that. On the Manafort suit, the Justice Department uh, issued a statement late last night calling it frivolous, adding that the defendant is entitled to file whatever he or she wants, and there was no immediate response from the Office of Special Counsel that represents Robert Mueller, Bill. Perhaps forthcoming. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine Harris, You're though, welcome. in Washington. Talks set to resume between North and South Korea. Could they cause a problem for U.S. strategy in the region? Also, a couple embraces as their attempt to run from the police and a stolen truck comes to an end. Check out how this thing wound up. Oh, yeah. Can't make it up, Sandra. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to this uh, rising protest in Iran now as massive anti-government protests enter now their eighth day with scenes like these. Big crowds there in the towns outside of Tehran, the capital city. At least 20 protesters have died since the demonstration started. A new Wall Street Journal op-ed arguing that the world must now decide whether or not there are true Iranian partners or the government that signed the nuclear deal or the people you see in the streets today. Saying, quote, the moment has arrived to admit that Iran's missiles, nuclear technology and armies won't stay inside its borders until the people getting shot in the streets are recognized and supported by a too timid world. End quote. Dan Henninger, Wall Street Journal. With me now, retired four star General Jack Keane, chairman for the Institute for Study of War and a Fox News senior strategic analyst. How you doing? Yeah, good to be here, Bill. Heather Nauert was with us about 90 minutes ago from the State Department. I'll play a clip in a moment here. But first, I, I, I want you to be able to frame this situation in the following way. Are these protesters stronger than they were in 2009? Is the potential for a regime overthrow there, or is it exaggerated? Well, I, the, the crowd in Tehran in 2009 was three million, and, and that was massive. It was as a result of a, a phony election. I think the fissures here are considerably deeper. It cuts right across the political and social fabric of the entire nation because there's dozens of cities involved. In 2009, it was largely urban elite. 
This represents the entire social fabric and there's a lot of younger people involved in this demonstration. So I think the Iranians are going to take a long time if they ever recover from this. I'm talking about wow. the government. They recovered quickly from 2009 because they killed all the leaders and they made certain there was no other demonstration to follow on. This, this deep cuts so deep. It, there's huge potential problems for them. I don't believe this will not will lead to an overthrow of the regime. No one knows that for sure, to be frank about it. As of now, you do not. Do not know. But the fact is, the Iranian government is going to be hurt. I don't think they'll ever be back to where they were because they have so squandered the opportunity to improve the quality of life for the people as a result of sanction relief for $100 billion plus. And what they've got here is an economic deteriorating situation. Oh, that's a strong statement, General. Heather Nauert was talking about the people of Iran who thought they were going to get a good deal through the Iranian nuclear deal um, and found out otherwise. Is she? They expected to get something out of the Iran nuclear deal. The leaders there of that country promised that that money would benefit all the citizens, but yet we have seen Iran take that money and funnel it into the Houthi rebels in, uh, in Yemen. We've seen them send, spend money in Syria. We've seen them outfit Hezbollah. They're not spending their money on their own people. She's got a point. No, that's, that's what I'm saying. And listen, listen they're, they're buying ballistic missile technology with a single purpose only. Why do you have ballistic missiles? To deliver a nuclear weapon. And that's what they're investing in. They've got 160,000 rockets and missiles now in Lebanon in the hands of the Hezbollah. One reason only, to fire those missiles eventually at Israel. They're running the war in Syria. They started the civil war in Yemen with the Houthi rebels. They're providing all the missile technology, all the arms, all the weapons. That's what they did with the money. It, it's outrageous. The, the very reason why we did the nuclear deal, if remember the premise that the Obama administration made was simply this, that by legitimizing Iran as a result of the deal, they would respond positively and join the community of responsible nations and it would incentivize them to stop their malign and aggressive behavior in the region. What happened as a result of the nuclear deal and a hundred million dollars windfall? They accelerated their aggressive behavior. Uh, pretty remarkable. Move east, way east. Thirty minutes ago we confirmed through the Associated Press that the military exercises with South Korea and the United States military will go on pause now until after the Winter Olympics, which takes you to the very end of February. This is something the North Korean leadership wanted, and yeah. now it, it appears that it'll happen. What our do you think of this? I, I think it's a smart move. Listen, our, our, our policy is North Korea must denuclearize. They cannot nuclear tip ICBMs pointed at the United States. We're not going to tolerate that. But to get them to go immediately to that position, I think is too hard. Because they don't believe us. Their only reason why they want nuclearized ICBMs is because they believe the United States will conduct a regime change. Their evidence of that is Gaddafi, who gave up his WMD, and we conducted a regime change after. So they don't buy our rhetoric. We've got to demonstrate to them that we are absolutely not interested in North Korea's regime change. Toning down the exercises, the frequency and the scale of them with South Korea, which are designed, Bill, to conduct regime change, and they know it will be a step in that direction. Maybe this is the breakthrough that we've been looking for. We'll have to see. I'm looking at your conclusion about a military option, whether or not we're getting closer or not toward it. Is we, that imminent or not, General? Well, that's a great word. I think we are getting closer to exercising a military option because nothing else seems to be working unless this new, this new, this new issue will materialize. However, it's not imminent. And you know why? Because if it was imminent, we would be telling the, the several hundred thousand Americans to leave South Korea. Mm -hmm. We'd be evacuating our families. There would be military deployments that we would not be able to do in secret. Air, maritime, and ground forces would be on the move. That's when war is imminent. That's not right now. A lot to watch and a lot to follow. Thank you, sir. Yeah, good talking to you. General Jack Keane here in New York. Thank you. Sandra, what's next? Well, as we've been mentioning, Bill, breaking news on the feud between the Trump administration and this new book about his campaign. We are now hearing Trump's lawyers are planning to sue the publisher to stop publication of that book, Fire and Fury. More on that straight ahead.
Now to a Fox News alert. Attorneys for President Trump are now sending a cease and desist letter to the publisher of an upcoming book detailing claims of chaos inside the White House. The letter specifically calls to stop further publication, release or dissemination of the book in any excerpts. The president's lawyers are also demanding a full and complete retraction as well as an apology. Joining me now are Jessica Tarlov, a Democratic strategist and Fox News contributor, and Lawrence Jones, conservative commentator and host of The Lawrence Jones Show. Good of both of you to be here. Lawrence, your thoughts as this news breaks. Uh, this is a mess. Um, first of all, I want to understand how he even got in the White House. The, no one has been able to say exactly how he got in the White You're House. You're talking about the author of the this, book, obviously. Right, right. Wolf, how did he get in the White House? I mean, everybody knows this guy is a sleaze, and he has a history well, of being one. So why would they allow him in the White House? Number two, this is becoming very complicated because now Wolf is saying that he has tapes, which goes against the narrative of the people that are now saying that they didn't say that if he releases the tapes and it is their voice. Well, well, I, I can give you somewhat mess. of an answer to that question because the White House was asked that yesterday, Lawrence, right? Uh, Sarah Sanders was able to say 95% of the time he spent in the White House, it was with Steve Bannon. Jessica? Well, I agree with Lawrence insofar as I have no idea why anyone in the White House thought that it was a good idea to invite anyone in. I disagree that Michael Wolf is a known sleaze, but we can debate that at another time. It's obviously not a smart move. This White House has had trouble throughout the last year with getting their story straight. Uh, people have very differing views on these sorts of things. And when you're talking to controversial characters like Steve Bannon, who confirmed the account yesterday, he said, yes, I absolutely said that Don Jr. and Jared Kushner and Paul Manafort acted in a treasonous way when they took that meeting at Trump Tower. Uh, the White House should have been much more careful about this. And it was within their purview to reject Michael Wolff's requests for interviews. Well, Lawrence, as this news was breaking at first, we had confirmed that the White House was asking for publication uh, to actually stop of the book. And now now we learn that they're suing for the stopping of this publication. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure that I blame the White House for suing when you have all these people that have supposedly uh, been the sources in the book saying that they didn't say that stuff um, besides Mr. Bannon. Um, I, I get their reason for saying this is slander of the president when they feel like it's these things and the people that they say are in this book are obviously saying it's not true. So I get that from a legal standpoint of them going to court to battle this out. But it still becomes very complicated now that they're saying that they have tapes. Michael, I'm sorry, is saying that he has tapes. And how will the White House respond to that? That's what I want to know. And in the president's um, lawyer's writing in this letter that I have in my hand, Jessica, uh, he states that the publication um, is false, baseless, includes false and baseless statements about the president, uh, gives rise to, among other claims, defamation by libel. It goes on to also uh, talk about the inducement of breach of contract uh, for this to continue. It's a, it's a lengthy letter, by the way. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. And I, I agree with Lawrence insofar as I think this is all that the White House can do at this point. But we do know that they gave him access. And if he does have the tapes, that is going to be incredibly complicated. And I would imagine that his publisher was prepared for something like this when you're dealing with the Trump administration, which throws around lawsuits all the time. I mean, Donald Trump said he was going to sue every woman who accused him of sexual harassment. Is it no surprise that a book that's coming out that's criticizing him and everyone in his administration using quotes, as they're saying, and maybe tapes to back them up would yeah. then say that they were going to sue. So I imagine the publisher knew that this was coming and has done the due diligence and the checks to make sure that they're on the solid footing. Go ahead, Lawrence. But the big question is, did these employees, former employees, breach their contract, not just in the White House, but uh, from the campaign? And we know Donald Trump, he's been a businessman for years. I'm sure with all the attorneys that surround him, that all these people sign confidential uh, statements. Oh, Lawrence, and I don't... They? We saw, I don't so, think so that that's wait, necessarily true. Here. This is the Jessica, most wait. disorganized White House. Let me get this in here. Well, Steve Bannon did, the lawyer say, uh, says, sign a, a confidentiality agreement uh, with the White most House definitely. and the president. In here, it specifically states uh, that in that contract, he was not just supposed to disclose any confidential information to anyone of or about Mr. Trump or any of his family members, any of his businesses or the campaign. Uh, he wasn't supposed to communicate with any members of the print or electronic media about Mr. Trump. Uh, he was not also he was also spot, not supposed to disparage the president or any of his family members or any of the businesses and campaign. It is very specific about the agreement that Mr. Bannon signed.
Okay. Well, then I guess Mr. Bannon's going to be in trouble as well because he certainly did disparage <laughs> right. the president and his family members. But that doesn't speak to everyone who's quoted in this book as having signed an NDA. Um, Bannon takes uh, this responsibility on himself, and I believe he knows exactly what he's doing. And the fact that he then confirmed, yes, I said that explicitly, when he knows all well and good that he signed that and what he should be saying and what he shouldn't be saying, he's making a larger point here and obviously doesn't care and about Lawrence, the legal also, repercussions. Also, what would tell me that the White House has not seen the full transcript of the book uh, under right. the section Mr. Trump's demands in this letter from Trump's lawyer uh, they are requesting to please send immediately an electronic copy of the full text of the book in searchable form and send via messenger a hard copy of the book to my office to the lawyer's office at the, um, at the top of the letter so that they can fully assess the statements in the book. Lawrence? Look, I, I am not a lawyer, but I am a, a private investigator who worked on many cases. Um, I don't see a judge granting this. Um, I think that's a big ask. He, and I, you know, I'm a supporter of the president. I believe that he should be attacking uh, this right now. But I don't see a judge granting him the full transcript uh, of, of this book. Uh, look, uh, it's going to be a tough ask. Well, there are copies of the book available. I mean, reporter, people have gotten advanced copies to do reviews and things like that. The President of the United States of America can get a copy of this book. Uh, I don't think that that's really the issue here. The issue is, as we began, that he gave unfettered access to the White House for someone who you had no idea what he was going to write or what people were going to say. There have been unprecedented leaks out of this White House. We know that there are Twitter accounts popping up constantly. There are people who are speaking on the record, off the record, saying disparaging things about the president and this administration, but, you had to know that inviting him in would end up in this way when you have characters like not, Bannon and Scaramucci right, and We are all going to have to leave it there. Lawrence Jones, if you have a quick comment, I'll give last word to well, you. Well, it's not just now. These leaks aren't just a matter of legal uh, as far as violating the confidentiality agreement. It's a matter if these people leaked information that was protected, that was intelligence, that was guarded by being executive members of the president's cabinet. But like, the president Hold is, on. And, and, and as far as how the lawyer leaves this off, he says in the near future, you, sh you should expect to hear from this office in greater detail on all the foregoing issues. You are now on notice, this letter states. All right. We just got a hold of that. So thanks for going thanks through a lot, it with Sandra. us. Bye, thanks, Lawrence. John Scott's on notice right now.